Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Crawford Prize Symposium in Polyarthritis. And the theme of today is Autoinflammatory Diseases. My name is Hans Eldegren. I'm Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Judging from the program of today's symposium and the scientific excellence represented by the speakers, it promises to be a most exciting event. I'm so glad that we have so many uh, very prominent scientists from basically all over the world who have come here uh, to salute the prize winner, but also to discuss science in this particular uh, area of the auto-inflammatory uh, diseases. Um, of course, the opening talk will be given by the Crawford Prize winner, Daniel Kastner. I think that will set the stage uh, for, for the, the level of science excess, scientific excellence of today. The symposium is organized by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and I would like now to take this opportunity before I need to head off to the other four uh, symposia we have today to thank the organizing committee uh, from members of the Royal Academy and others who have uh, made this symposium look uh, as exciting as it does, actually. The mission of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences uh, prioritize four areas. The first two is to support uh, science for policy and to influence the policy for science. The other two is that we want to be a meeting place for science and also to promote and award scientific excellence. It is the two latter aims that we are here for today. Uh, the Academy's two most prominent prizes are the Nobel Prize and the Creffold Prize. We awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and Physics and the Prize in Economy to the memory of Alfred Nobel. We award the five Crawford Prizes in Astronomy, Biosciences, Geosciences, in Mathematics, and, and that's of course the reason we're here today, in Polyarthritis. I hope that you will find this symposium rewarding. Uh, I really wish you a great day. Uh, I know it will be followed by, by a dinner tonight, uh, so there will be plenty of opportunity to talk to each other today. And uh, by that, I leave the word to Professor Ole Kempe, who will introduce the prize winner. So have a nice day. So it's my great honor and privilege to introduce the uh, 2021 Crawford Laureate in Polyarthritis, Dan Kastner. So uh, he gets the prize for establishing the concept of auto-inflammatory disorders. But before I introduce Dr. Kastner, I would like to say a few words about the Crawford Foundation. It was founded by Holger Crawford. Holger Crawford came from a humble background. He had a single mother who had a shop in Stockholm selling milk. But she was determined to give Holger a good education. And he actually graduated as number one from the Stockholm School of Economics, which is the most prestigious economic school in Sweden. And was rapidly then recruited by Rousing to a company here in Lund, Åke Lund and Rousing. And in 1951, being the CEO of that company at a very young age, he was a co-founder of Tetra Pak. And uh, Tetra Pak is this ingenious way to package milk. The first time milk was packaged in, in paper like this. And uh, what this is actually was part of an exhibition at MoMA in 2004. Uh, he later stopped being the CEO of Tetra Pak and uh, 
1965, he sold his shares, had a lot of money and didn't know what to do with them. And he met a nephrologist at Lund's University who said he had an idea how to get the dialysis machine working. So he took all his money and a bit more actually and put into the development of this, started a company called Gambro, it's world renowned nowadays for dialysis machines. Gambro is actually an abbreviation of Gamla Broga och Dansk Sjukvårds Axelblag, which roughly translates to um, the medical supply company of the old Bridge Street. And um, he later, in 1994, the foundation sold all shares in Gambro, and since then has a lot of money. The, the money goes in part to the five Crawford Prizes, but also to a large extent supporting science and, and young scientists and has given out to scientists more than two billion Swedish crowns during the years. For the Crawford Prize in polyarthritis was a bit special. The other four prizes are complementing the Nobel Prizes in areas where Nobel Prizes are not given. That's not the case for the prize in polyarthritis. And the reason for this is that Holger Krafford himself suffered from a severe polyarthritis in his later years. And as you can see, the, the prize can given, be given for to shed light on disease mechanisms in rheumatoid arthritis or other chronic inflammatory diseases. And that's what we are giving the prize for today, or provide new therapeutic opportunity, which is also what this year's laureate has provided. So he is in a long row of prominent prize winners. Last time, it was four years ago, was, uh, the prize was given for regulatory T cells. And as you can see, there is a long list. The first Crawford prizes were given in 1982. So this year is a 40 year jubilee. But for the prize in polyarthritis, Holger Crawford specifically wrote that it should only be given if there had been any progress in the area. And for Holger himself, during his years when he suffered from rheumatoid arthritis, he could see no progress whatsoever. That's why the first prize was not given until year 2000. So, <coughs> we're here to honor Dr. Dan Kastner today. He is the scientific director of intramural research at the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH. And he joined the NIH already in 1985 as a quite young specialist, um, gaining his MD PhD from Baylor and a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, I understand, uh, from Princeton. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. And he established the concept of a completely new entity of disorders, which is remarkable. And the first was the familiar Mediterranean fever, where he made seminal discoveries, first in 1992, finding a region for this disease, which was the same in all people, and in 1997 actually cloning the gene responsible, which turned out to be uh, pyrexin, a completely new uh, type of protein. He then went out to find another periodic fever, traps or 
TNF receptor associated periodic syndrome. And it was then that the concept that this might be a group of autoinflammatory disorders was established. And he has then went on to we today count more than 40 autoinflammatory disorders, and half of them can be attributed to Dr. Kastner. And as you can see, he's very fond of acronyms. <laughs> and uh, the list could be made even longer. So what is the difference between an autoimmune disease and an autoinflammatory disease? There are quite a few scientists who, who don't quite understand the difference, even people within the field. And of course, there are forms that might be somewhere in between. But in essence, autoimmune diseases are diseases that affect the adaptive immune system, our T and B cells. It's usually a complex inheritance. And you also usually find autoantibodies. Whereas in autoinflammatory disease, it's the other part of the immune system, the innate immune system. Often, but not always, monogenetic. And we don't find any autoantibodies in this disease. The autoinflammatory disorders, as further dissected by Dr. Kastner, can be further subdivided into a lot of different forms, which we will hear more about today. And by this, I finish my introduction and uh, ask Dr. Kastner to give his prize lecture here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shampe, for that really, really kind introduction. And also, uh, thank you for uh, covering a lot of the territory that sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about uh, this morning. So that's really, uh, that's really terrific. I certainly want to thank you for, for the kind introduction and the, uh, the wonderful summary. Uh, but of course, I want to thank the Crawford Foundation and the estate of Holger and Anna Greta Crawford uh, for their uh, foresight and generosity. I think that it's so important having these kinds of, of uh, recognitions of, of scientific uh, activity. It really is, I think, important to all of us as practicing scientists to have these kinds of uh, events and, and uh, mechanisms for thinking about taking stock of, of where we are uh, in a particular field. So I want to thank them. And of course, I want to thank the Royal Swedish Academy for, uh, for selecting me for this incredibly uh, high honor. So, so in any case, that, that really is, is very, very important. Um, what we will talk about uh, this morning is, is um, sort of going forward from what Dr. Shumpy had uh, discussed in terms of some of the early uh, autoinflammatory diseases. There certainly are uh, lots of them. Actually, in the discussion before the meeting, uh, a colleague from India uh, was telling me about uh, a project that she was uh, just starting, uh, trying to collect samples from patients with uh, autoinflammatory disease. And she had hoped to be able to collect samples from 150 patients over the course of four years. And in less than a year, she's already collected 100 samples. Uh, so it's, it really is remarkable. I think that just recognition of these diseases, understanding that they're there, knowing what, at least in general, they look like and how to uh, diagnose them, makes a huge difference. And as we discussed yesterday, and we'll discuss at least a little bit today, targeted therapies can make an enormous difference in people's lives uh, in terms of uh, how they will uh, deal with autoinflammatory disease going forward. And so that's something that certainly we need to uh, bear in mind. 
So anyway, the title of my talk is Autoinflammatory Disease and the Human Condition, a very high-sounding uh, title, I guess. Um, and the, the idea here is that in, in some sense, I, I do feel, and perhaps part of the reason that I feel this way is just <laughs> what I've been doing for the last 30 years or whatever, that there's some, some degree of inevitability uh, in terms of uh, the autoinflammatory diseases in the human condition. And, and I'll try to argue during the course of this talk, uh, the, both with regard to uh, inborn errors of innate immunity, that just because of uh, the fallibility of, of uh, DNA replication, that it's not always a perfect uh, system, and that, that uh, there are a lot of us, and more and more of us, that are, are uh, in the offing, uh, that mistakes uh, do happen every once in a while that can lead to inborn errors of innate immunity, some of which um, are already known and others of which are new and can even be opportunities for us to learn something about uh, human biology and therapeutics and so forth. So that's one thing. Second thing is, is just the idea of uh, selection uh, and that at least in some cases there may be uh, pathogens that will select for particular variants that uh, uh, may be protective uh, for those uh, pathogens but may also confer risk uh, for autoinflammation. And then a third area that has been of great interest to our group over the course of the last couple of years is the whole question of somatic uh, mutation and, and the idea that later in life, uh, just as is the case for cancer, uh, that in fact uh, there can be uh, various um, uh, mistakes, if you will, in terms of uh, uh, replication, or in some cases it's not even mitosis dependent. It's just uh, based on environmental factors or whatever that induce a mutation in a subset of cells that are important in terms of some immunologic function that then lead to an autoinflammatory disease. So there's just lots of ways that you can end up at that place of uh, having autoinflammatory disease. Uh, this is just a list of um, the uh, autoinflammatory diseases that we've worked on in my lab uh, over the course of uh, uh, the last 30 years or whatever it is. Um, there's 16 of them, and, and um, I'll just mention that, you know, um, 14 of them weren't even in the medical textbooks uh, back at the time that we started with this. There, there was, in the case of traps, uh, there was the name familial Hibernian fever, although it turned out that it has a much broader uh, ethnic distribution than, than just Irish. And in fact, the initial family was half Irish, half Scottish, and it turned out that when we figured out the gene, it came from the Scottish side of the family, so it really should have been called familial Caledonian fever rather than Hibernian fever anyway. Um, but uh, not going there, there's, there's a bunch of them. There are, uh, as, as Dr. Champy said, um, uh, probably 40 or 50 uh, at this point, monogenic autoinflammatory diseases. And there's, there's no reason to believe that there aren't a whole bunch more. And, and certainly uh, having um, uh, studies particularly of, of uh, consanguineous uh, populations, uh, there's, there's opportunities to find a number of other uh, inborn errors of, of innate immunity, and if you know where to look, uh, probably there are opportunities for finding somatic mutations as well. Um, and there are, although there are fewer of them, also uh, 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 complex uh, autoinflammatory diseases, Betchett's disease and FAPA being probably the, the more prominent ones, and perhaps, uh, you know, in some cases, some of the patients that are said to have rheumatoid arthritis and lupus uh, may in fact have uh, autoinflammatory diseases, at least in some cases, and certainly we're, we're uh, having some exciting adventures in scleroderma that I won't talk about uh, today because it's still a little bit early, but uh, uh, it's likely that uh, there are uh, monogenic uh, forms of that as well. So, lessons learned over the last decade, uh, some monogenic immunologic disorders present with combinations of autoinflammation, autoimmunity, uh, and immunodeficiency. Innate immune sensing of microbial pathogens uh, may involve uh, perturbation of cellular homeostasis. This, I think, is a really important concept that, that at least in some cases, you're dealing, some of the, the building blocks of the innate immune system are sensors, are receptors for bacterial products, 
But in other cases, what's being sensed is actually some sort of a homeostatic change in cells, uh, which is then what triggers uh, the inflammatory process. And certainly, the pyrin inflammasome is one example of that from the last five years. Genetic variants that influence basic cell biologic processes, such as cytoskeletal organization and cell death, uh, sometimes can cause autoinflammation. So that really gives us the idea that <laughs> we're not just dealing with, with uh, inflammatory cells, we're dealing with all of cell biology. And, and really, you know, as the rheumatologists would say, the knee bone is connected to the ankle bone, and it's all uh, integrated uh, together, and you just have to uh, recognize that, you know, these are processes that are, are integrated uh, in a human being. Um, uh, while some monogenic autoinflammatory diseases are, truly are inborn errors of innate immunity, somatic mutation is now increasingly recognized. Cassettes of relatively frequent genetic variants confer risk of common autoinflammatory conditions, and Elaine Remmers is going to be talking about that. So, the first part of the talk, uh, this was all just not talk, I guess, uh, is um, uh, the inborn errors of innate immunity and things that are going on in our group uh, with regard to that, or recently published work uh, anyway. And this is the work of uh, Ivona Aksentievich, who is uh, here in the uh, audience today, and certainly uh, could give this talk uh, easily uh, if, if I were to, you know, slip and fall or something like that. Uh, Steve Boyden, uh, who uh, uh, is now at the University of Utah, Ching Zhao, uh, who's uh, uh, a junior faculty member in China, Kalpana Manthram, who's a junior faculty in NIAID, Hiro Oda, who's uh, just taken a faculty position uh, in Cologne, and uh, Christina Kozicki, uh, who's uh, uh, finishing up her clinical fellowship uh, in our group. Uh, so the first of the diseases that I'll talk about just a little bit is the disease CREA syndrome, which stands for uh, cleavage-resistant rip kinase-induced autoinflammation, CRIA, another of the acronyms that, of course, I uh, love to uh, coin. Uh, so in any case, this is a story that actually goes back a couple of decades. Uh, family number two is a family that uh, we first saw at the NIH back in the late 1990s, a family from uh, the Bay Area of uh, California. Uh, Three-generation inheritance of recurrent fevers, painful lymphadenopathy, uh, and organomegaly, uh, both splenomegaly and uh, hepatomegaly. And then families one and three are uh, singleton cases that turned out to be de novo mutations in the gene that we'll be talking about. The clinical phenotype is illustrated here on these scans, diffuse uh, adenopathy, hepatomegaly, and splenomegaly, and all three families have mutations in RIPK1. RIPK1, as I think many of you know, is a signaling molecule uh, that uh, can be cleaved by caspase 8, and it's not been known exactly what is the biologic significance, what, what uh, cleavage by caspase 8 would do uh, to the function of RIP kinase. And in these three families, you have mutations uh, at three different mutations at position 324, which is where it gets cleaved by uh, caspase 8. Uh, the first family is substitution of asparagine for aspartate at position 324, second family histidine for aspartate, and the third family tyrosine for aspartate. Uh, that's a highly conserved residue throughout uh, evolution. If one looks in a transfection system, one can see uh, that um, where you're supposed to get cleavage, you do, and where you're not supposed to get cleavage, you don't, and in the transfections of the uh, mutant forms, you don't get cleavage. Uh, so in any case, if you look then in the blood of these patients, they have elevated levels of the three pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF, IL-6, and IL-1 beta. Uh, by gene expression profiling, they have a markedly inflammatory uh, signature, uh, and uh, at least uh, the patient from Texas uh, shows is a very prominent uh, uh, response to tocilizumab uh, as a treatment. 
And then uh, what we did in collaboration with Najwa Lalawi and John Silk's group in Australia uh, is that we generated uh, a knock-in mouse uh, for this. Uh, the the knock-in mouse has the substitution at position 325, which is the mouse homologue of the cleavage site that we have at 324 in humans. And these mice have also elevated levels of TNF, IL-6, and IL-1 beta, uh, just as the humans do. Um, but then the thing that you can do is you can breed these mice against other strains of mice that have mutations, that have knockouts of particular genes that are involved in signaling in order to figure out, well, what's the mechanism of disease? And so uh, what uh, Najwa and John did was to breed these mice uh, with RIPK3 knockout, uh, caspase 8 knockout, so a double knockout strain of mice. And basically what they found was that uh, one had a reduction, a fairly marked reduction in TNF in the blood of those uh, mice uh, and a very dramatic uh, reduction in IL-1 beta. And so the conclusion uh, and this is why the paper got published in Nature, is not because uh, we have a new disease that's seen in three different families, uh, but because it tells us what is the biologic role of the cleavage of RIPK1 by caspase 8, and that is that it's a molecular switch between cell survival and apoptosis, necroptosis induced inflammation. Well, then, following up upon that, close on the heels of that, is this paper uh, from uh, Dusan Bogunovich uh, and Ivona Aksentievich was one of the co-authors of this too, uh, dealing with uh, patients that have a deficiency in another gene called TBK1. And some of you are aware of the fact that TBK1 is a signaling molecule that's involved in type 1 interferon responses in uh, response to uh, viral uh, infection. But it turns out from this study that TBK1 is also an important regulator of our friend RIPK1. And that if you're deficient, humans are deficient in TBK1, uh, they don't have a huge problem with antiviral responses. But what does happen is that the normal Normal regulation of RIP kinase uh, is uh, inhibited, and so you get increased amounts of RIP kinase induced apoptosis and necroptosis, and thereby a TNF dependent uh, cell death uh, that leads to an auto inflammatory process. And so basically, two different diseases, CREA and uh, TBK1 uh, deficiency, both of which are dependent upon. Uh, RIPK1-induced cell death leading to auto-inflammation. So it's a, a general principle. And then, uh, as if that's not enough, you know, I figure that we may as well be the dead horse here, so to speak, and, and talk about a third disease uh, where uh, cell death uh, plays a role in auto-inflammation. And this is a new disease that we haven't published yet but are getting ready to submit. And this is a disorder called Sharpenia. And Sharpenia is a disorder in which patients have uh, a loss of function, homozygous biallelic loss of function mutation, and Sharpen. And Sharpen is a component of Lubac, uh, which uh, our friend Dr. Uh, Casanova here in the group knows a lot about. Uh, uh, it's the linear ubiquitin assembly complex uh, comprised of, of uh, Sharpen, uh, Hoyle 1, and Hoyp. Uh, and basically, this is a complex that puts ubiquitin chains, linear ubiquitin chains, on certain signaling complexes uh, to uh, stabilize them uh, in uh, uh, immune cells. And so we were uh, referred uh, a patient from South India five years ago or something like that, who uh, is shown here in this pedigree. Uh, he is the son of uh, an uncle-niece uh, marriage. And um, He's homozygous for the mutation that I'll tell you about. Uh, we first saw him uh, at the age of 15, I think it was, and he had a lifelong history of recurrent fevers, arthritis, uh, parotitis, uh, which is kind of interesting, uh, and colitis uh, as well. And um, 
uh, we received a sample from him, and uh, Ivona found that that uh, he has a, a frame shift mutation in the gene encoding Sharpen. Uh, in the lower left, you see uh, a scan uh, showing uh, enlargement of uh, the parotid glands, um, and here is the frame shift mutation that he has in the coil coil uh, domain of Sharpen. And, and then, you know, this is just one of these small world kinds of things. So um, I was um, going to speak at a meeting in uh, Bangalore uh, that Sudhir Gupta had put on, and the meeting was in a hotel in Bangalore. And it turned out uh, that this guy, this patient, actually was cared for in a hospital that was just across the street from the hotel uh, where this meeting was. So I checked into the hotel and then went across the street and examined the patient and, and gave a lecture to the, uh, to the uh, medical staff who were there in the hospital. So it was, you know, the greatest thing ever. Uh, and, uh, and the patient really did have, you know, what we heard that he had, and, and it was really kind of neat and interesting. I mean, not for the patient, obviously, but ultimately it did turn out perhaps to be. And that is that um, this Sharpen gene had um, just by chance been knocked out in mice, you know, just in a, a breed of mice called the CPDM mouse. Uh, and the, so the CPDM mouse is, is homozygous for a loss of function mutation in Sharpen, and if you breed the CPDM mouse, uh, it has an inflammatory phenotype. If you breed them onto a TNF knockout background, then all the inflammation goes away. So that made us think that, you know, maybe we could actually treat this young man with a TNF inhibitor and you know, make him better. So, so, you know, in order to do that, you know, the first thing was that we wanted to bring him to the NIH uh, so that we could be sure that um, he didn't, that his fevers were not caused by some sort of an opportunistic infection, you know, by TB or something like that. So we brought him to the NIH, and uh, these are just some scans that we got, and you can see arthritis in his ankle. Uh, you can see arthritis in the atlantoaxial joint, it's shown there in the middle with the red arrow, uh, which, as some of you may know, uh, for patients with rheumatoid arthritis can be fatal. Uh, so this is a serious problem. Uh, and then the arrow in the lower right uh, shows inflammation of the colon. He had colitis. So he definitely had the problems that we had heard he had, and uh, he didn't have TB, and we did, for example, aspirate his ankle joint just to make sure that he didn't have uh, mycobacteria in the synovial fluid, uh, and um, we looked in terms of um, some of the, the immunologic function that he had, and sure enough, he had uh, reduced uh, signaling, uh, TNF-induced uh, canonical NF-kappa-B signaling, uh, but did have, coming back to the, the theme of a couple minutes ago, uh, comparing control with, uh, with samples from him, increased uh, cell death induced uh, by TNF. So, so he had this process of, of basically TNF-induced cell death, which made us think that maybe we could treat him uh, with a TNF inhibitor. Uh, so we tried, you know, ever so carefully. Uh, so we started out, you know, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, uh, we started him on a Tanercept. And actually, at the time that we first saw him at the, at the clinical center, he had to use a wheelchair uh, to get around because of his arthritis in his ankle, and, and uh, he seemed to do okay on a Tanercept, and then we switched him to adalimumab, the monoclonal antibody. Um, and over the course of time, his arthritis uh, resolved. You can see the photos there in the middle. Um, and the scans that the arthritis uh, resolved, his colitis resolved. You can see that in panel C uh, up in the upper right. Um, he was off the growth curves, and, and we got him back onto the growth curves, both by height and weight, and his bone density uh, improved. And so a year after we started him on a TNF inhibitor, uh, here he is in clinic. And so, you know, we don't put all of our patients through these kinds of paces, but some of them we do. So, you know, after a year, instead of him being in a wheelchair, he's dancing, you know, so this was great. 
Uh, so we were really happy with this, and you know, it makes you believe in science, you know, which is what you want to do. Um, so in any case, so that now we're going to move away from cell death uh, and into something else, uh, and this is um, uh, sort of a uh, brave new world kind of thing for us. So this has to do with uh, a molecule called ALPK1, uh, which is a, an alpha kinase that Feng Xiao uh, figured out back in 2018 in a Nature paper uh, is involved in the sensing of seven carbon sugars. So why would you want to sense seven carbon sugars? Well, it turns out we make six carbon sugars, but bacteria, at least some bacteria, make seven carbon sugars. So they can make a kind of sugar that we can't make, and it's not that we are, you know, sugar fiends or anything like that, but obviously if you're thinking about how to design an innate immune system, then if you have an innate immune system that somehow can be triggered by seven carbon sugars, you have a way of detecting certain kinds of bacterial infection. So, so that's kind of neat. So anyway, so ALPK1 um, is a kinase that can be triggered uh, by seven carbon sugars inside of the cell. A year later, a group at uh, the University of Utah described this disease. I did not come up with this acronym. ROSA, um, uh, which stands for Retinal Dystrophy, Optic Nerve Edema, Splenomegaly, Anhydrosis, and Migraine Headache. And it turns out that Patients that have that constellation have, the Utah group described uh, the first mutation of uh, methionine for threonine at position 237, they have mutations in this ALPK1 gene, gain-of-function mutations in, in ALPK1 that uh, are associated with this uh, ROSA syndrome. So Christina Kazicki in, in our group has gotten very interested in ROSA syndrome and has been uh, collaborating with the ophthalmologists at the NIH, and we now have probably the largest cohort of ROSA patients in the world, for whatever that distinction is, is worth. Um, and ALPK1 is interesting because it's really uh, a branch of, of a group of kinases that are just not that um, common uh, in the human genome. So perhaps there's something to be learned about that family of kinases as well, uh, and that's part of what interests us uh, with this. So here are just a few of the clinical features of Rosa syndrome, the optic disc edema that you can see on the left. These patients also can have calcifications of the basal ganglia, like patients with Icardi Gutierrez. Uh, syndrome. They can have an inflammatory arthritis, as shown there uh, on the right-hand side in the middle. And as you can see, these patients can have massive splenomegaly, and at least in some cases, they need to have uh, splenectomies to prevent them from having uh, trauma-induced uh, uh, splenic rupture. Uh, so important to recognize for th those reasons. These patients, if you look at uh, NF-kappa B signaling, uh, they do have uh, increased uh, NF-kappa B signaling and increased uh, interferon uh, signaling pathways as well. Um, they definitely do respond to various cytokine inhibitors, and so you can control their constitutional symptoms and and that part of their disease that is caused by inflammation. But it's not clear at this point exactly what is the pathophysiology of the blindness in these patients, which is a very uh, frustrating and uh, disappointing kind of thing. So it appears that there may be structural abnormalities uh, in some of the uh, uh, sensing cells in the uh, retina that are involved in this too. So although uh, these patients will respond to TNF and IL-6 inhibitors in terms of their constitutional symptoms. That doesn't, at least at the stage where we have been able to diagnose them. Maybe if you started treating them at birth or something, that it would make a difference, but at least right now we cannot stop these kids from going blind. So, uh, so that's all I'm going to talk about for the monogenic diseases uh, at the moment. There are others that are out there, and, and as uh, I was saying to one of our colleagues from India who was asking, you know, this is like the question that people will, it used to be a question that people would ask, you know, well, have we learned everything that there is to know? You know, that, that uh, perhaps, you know, we're getting to an asymptote in terms of the level of knowledge of, 
humanity or whatever. Well, no, uh, not in general, uh, and not with regard to autoinflammatory diseases either. I think that there's plenty of cases, especially if you're studying um, monogenic diseases, there are plenty of opportunities for, for new discoveries, which may then point us to new um, realizations in terms of biology. So instead, I'm going to turn to the second phase of the inevitability, perhaps, of autoinflammatory disease, asking the question, why are there such high frequencies for FMF in multiple Middle Eastern populations? And this is the work of Johan Park, Jay Che, and Elaine Remmers. And uh, this uh, slide just shows a table uh, illustrating the frequency of FMF mutations in four high-risk populations, Turks, Armenians, Arabs, and non-Ashkenazi Jews. And you can see that the frequency is somewhere between 10 and 12 percent. Uh, which is really high, uh, and if you compare that, for example, with the carrier frequency for cystic fibrosis, uh, uh, which is the most, most uh, common lethal recessive disorder in North America, that's about 4%. The carrier frequency for the sickle cell trait in the African-American population is 8 to 10%, depending on the study that you look at. So 10 to 12% is, is really a high frequency. And the two possible, uh, the two most likely uh, mechanisms for having such a high carrier frequency would either be that there's some sort of a genetic drift where there's just a, a founder effect that's seen in, in the populations involved and it's just a matter of, of chance over time, uh, or that there may have been some uh, pathogen that was selecting for that. Um, and certainly, the data here in this table would perhaps argue a little bit against the genetic drift mechanism just by virtue of the fact that it's multiple mutations in multiple different populations and different mutations predominating in different populations. But, you know, if you just look at the fact that when we first discovered the gene for FMF back in the late 1970s, that in fact there is a very prominent founder effect, and in fact nearly anybody maybe anybody, uh, who has uh, the M694V mutation, which is depicted in the dashed line there, is de descended from a common founder that lived in the Middle East sometime uh, in around biblical times. And similarly, uh, for the V726A mutation, that there's a common founder. And that's part of the way that we found the gene for FMF, is that there's these founder chromosomes that helped us to narrow down the, the region of interest so that we could look at both observed recombinants in families, but also historical recombinants in these haplotypes in order to, to narrow down the, the intervals. So, so in order to think about whether there could be some signature for selection, uh, what one wants to do then is to look at the size of the haplotype that's associated either with the wild type, the normal form of, of a gene of interest, versus the mutant form of, of the gene of interest. And so this is a study that we did in the Turkish population where we had genomic data throughout the, uh, 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 we had data throughout the genome of, of Turkish individuals with, um, in some cases, FMF mutations, in a lot of cases, the wild type. And so what you're looking for here is the width of the peak. And so the, the blue peak represents the extent of the haplotype, the DNA fingerprint, that's associated with the M694V mutation, and then the uh, orange or brown, uh, represents the width of the haplotype that's associated with the wild-type form of, of the gene. And what you can see is that the, the haplotype that's associated with the mutant form of the gene is much bigger. It extends out like as much as a megabase in either direction from the gene itself. Uh, whereas for the wild-type version of the gene, it looks like a needle point or whatever. So it's, it's a relatively small haplotype of you know, the usual 20 to 30 KB, or something like that. So that's, that's um, at least a good start in terms of thinking about uh, selection. Then the other thing that you want to do is to compare the size of that haplotype with the size of all other haplotypes from the genome of the similar frequency. And if you do that, what you see is that, in fact, uh, that haplotype is towards the tail of the curve, which is what you would want to see if there is actually some evidence of selection by something. It doesn't tell you by what, uh, but uh, some evidence of selection. And one can analyze those data then in another way, and this is uh, 
uh, the work of Hua Chen, who was collaborating with us, looking at the selection coefficient that's associated with this M694V variant in the Turkish population compared with the selection coefficient for lactase persistence, the ability to digest cow's milk in adults uh, in the northern European population. That is a trait that is considered to be under selection. It's sort of like a prime example of something that's under selection in genetics uh, literature. So, so the selection coefficient of lactase persistence is 0.056. Selection coefficient for M694V in the Turkish population, 0.077. So, so there is evidence uh, for selection, and one can even take those same kinds of calculations and estimate approximately when the mutation would have arisen, and it's somewhere between two and 5,000 years ago. So then, if you think about, well, what kind of organism could it have been? And, and here, let me just say that, you know, we have not done the critical experiment in order to tell for sure what the organism was. You know, probably the gold standard for this uh, would be uh, the sickle cell trait and resistance to uh, malaria. And the studies that were done of that, which were conducted in the 1950s, are studies that we just could not do nowadays. So actually, in those studies, they actually took people who were either sickle cell carriers or people who were not sickle cell carriers, and they infected them with malarial mosquitoes. Uh, and then they looked to see whether or not they developed malaria or not. And the people who were sickle cell carriers, in fact, were relatively protected from the development of malaria under those experimental conditions. Well, we are not going to do this. Uh, we are not going to deliberately infect, you know, FMF carriers or non-carriers with plague or, you know, some other organism as a control. Uh, not going to do it, so you don't have to worry. Don't call the police. Uh, so, so, you know, some of this is just based on, you know, uh, whatever one can deduce. We do know that Yersinia pestis, which is the organism that we're talking about here, does make two toxins, Yap E and Yap T, that disrupt Rho A, which is a, uh, an intracellular molecule that lives on the inside of the cell membrane. And Rho A, if it is disrupted, that then triggers the pyrin inflammasome. And so, for sure, it's already known that plague does make a couple of toxins that can activate the pyrin inflammasome, but then it's also known, before we started doing this, that in fact plague also makes uh, a toxin called YAP-M, which leads to the direct phosphorylation of pyrin, which blocks the pyrin inflammasome. So it's kind of like a cat and mouse game, you know, where plague makes a toxin that triggers the pyrin inflammasome, but it also makes a toxin that inactivates the pyrin inflammasome. So that's kind of neat, you know, it makes you think that something was going on over the course of history with regard to this. But then if you look at, um, on the left-hand side of the slide, um, uh, pyrin from either healthy controls, and you see that, that in fact, Yersinia pestis does lead to a very marked phosphorylation of pyrin, but uh, when you take the pyrin from uh, FMF patients with various mutations that are designated there, it doesn't get phosphorylated, so it doesn't get blocked. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. And then if you predict, you would predict from that that then FMF patients or carriers for FMF would produce increased uh, IL-1 beta in vitro in response to Yersinia, and in fact, that's what we find. You don't see that difference in a strain of Yersinia that doesn't have YAP-M. That's what you would predict. Uh, and so uh, the Faustian bargain, if you want to call it that, of FMF would be in a healthy subject. This is what I've already told you. Yersinia pestis makes YAP-M, which leads to the phosphorylation of pyrin, which blocks the pyrin inflammasome and blocks IL-1 beta production and pyroptosis. Um, for individuals that are uh, carriers for FMF uh, mutation, well, carriers are next. Uh, for individuals that have FMF, two copies of the FMF mutation, uh, Yersinia pestis still makes YAP-M, but it doesn't nearly as effectively phosphorylate pyrin. So you can get IL-1 beta being produced. And in the carriers, that still 
works that still is operative, and so you still get IL-1 being produced. But where the Faustian bargain comes into this is the population genetics of a recessive disease. And that is simply that for a recessive disease, you have many more people who are carriers than who are affected that have biallelic mutations. Now, with FMF, it's not a pure recessive. For sure, that's the case. There are people that seem to have one mutation, in some cases, that are associated with disease. So it's not the pure case. But as much as you can think about this as being a recessive disease, you have a much higher carrier frequency for a recessive disease, around 10% of the population is what I just showed you, versus less than 1% uh, who are affected. So, therefore, the Faustian bargain is that 10% of the population gets protected against plague in exchange for 1% of the population dying of amyloidosis. Well, you know, the population genetics will select for that kind of a, a bargain. So then, uh, if one also does the substitute experiments in experimental animals, uh, one can see that there is some increase in protection of knock-ins of FMF mutations in mice uh, relative to knock-ins of the wild type. And if you do simulations based on the uh, estimated age of the FMF mutations, the history of plague in the Middle East, and, and plague was not just a, a one-time event, you know, the way we think of Black Death. Plague actually was endemic in the Middle East up until about 1875, uh, so there is a history there. Uh, and based on the selection coefficients, you actually end up with carrier frequencies that are close to what we observe uh, in the Turkish population. So then the third, uh, the third question, the third riddle of the Sphinx uh, is um, how do old people get autoinflammatory disease? A topic that's relevant to all of us. Uh, we hope it will be relevant to all of us uh, with time. Um, so, so in any case, this was the question asked by David Beck. Uh, a former fellow in the lab who's now an assistant professor at NYU uh, in collaboration with Peter Grayson, Marcy Ferrata, Keith Sakura, and Mandy Umbrello. And so uh, they decided to take a, sort of a, a different approach to gene discovery from what we usually take in our group. So our usual approach is a phenotype-first approach in which we will take a bunch of individuals who have some phenotype in common, some form of arthritis, some form of fever, some form of inflammation of some sort, group them together, and then do some sort of genetic or genomic studies to see what's in common amongst them, and then, voila, sometimes you discover a new disease gene. Well, so these guys were, you know, unhappy, uh, weren't satisfied with the current uh, state of affairs, and wanted to do things in a different way. And so the different way was this concept of genotype first. So the idea was that David made this list of all genes having to do with ubiquitilation in the human genome. Now, why did he choose ubiquitilation? Well, a couple of reasons. One is that He's an MD-PhD, he did his PhD work on ubiquitilation, so it was interesting to him. Well, you know, okay. Uh, and then the, the second thing was that there's a couple of uh, auto-inflammatory diseases that we had uh, already found, um, one of them haploinsufficiency of A20 and the other uh, deficiency of Otulin, uh, in which there are mutations in ubiquitin genes. So, you know, seemed like a good choice, ubiquitin genes. But there's a lot of them, 841. And then uh, what he was going to do was to uh, check those genes against 1,477 exomes or genomes from our cohort of patients, undiagnosed uh, patients. So here's the dirty laundry coming out that we don't have answers on all of our cases. Um, and then 1,083 exomes or genomes from the NIH undiagnosed diseases cohort. So over 2,500 individuals' exome or genome sequences looked at against 841 genes, and he was looking for genes that have a PLI of greater than 0.9, meaning the genes that are relatively intolerant to variation. He was looking for variants that are not present in the NOMAD database and that are shared amongst cases. And when he did that, after all of that, he came up with three middle-aged men. <laughs> 
uh, who were heterozygous for mutations at residue 41 of UBA1. So, you know, there's two ways of looking at this. You know, one is he only found three people out of 2,500 or something like that doing this. But on the other hand, you know, if you can, you know, study them and, and actually figure it out, you could get a New England Journal paper out of it. So what the heck, you know, that's okay. That's pretty good. Um, but, but there was actually a fly in the ointment. And the fly in the ointment is that UBA1, although it is a critical gene that's involved in ubiquitolation, it is the mother of all ubiquitolation because it is the first, it, it takes care of the first step in a three-step process of ubiquitolation. Um, so it's, it is essential. It is the essential molecule for ubiquitolation in all cells in the human body. So really a major, major gene, but but it is encoded on the X chromosome. And these are middle-aged men who are heterozygous for variants on the X chromosome. So for those of you who are awake, you are then thinking, well, so how can that be? Because these are men, and men only have one X chromosome, and so what's going on here? And, and so actually, the standard software for filtering DNA sequence throws out heterozygous calls for genes that are on the X chromosome as being likely sequencing errors. And so the first thing that had to be figured out is, was this a sequencing error? So, so David went back and, and checked to see if it was a sequencing error. Since I'm here telling you about this, you can guess what the answer was. No, it was not a sequencing error. So then, so then the second question, you know, are these guys aneuploid? Did they have an extra X chromosome? That's also possible, rarely. Uh, so we checked for that. Nope, they don't have that either. So then the third possibility is that maybe, just maybe, it is somatic mutation. And that, you know, what is going on is not that all cells in the body have the two different versions of the UBA1 gene, but instead that in the blood, some cells have the wild-type form and some cells have the mutant form, but when you mix them together and do the sequencing on the mix of DNA, it looks like all of the cells have both versions. You know, so that would be, that would be the other way of thinking about it. So uh, David looked at that. Uh, and so when he looked at that, you can see in the upper left-hand corner that in the peripheral blood, you have either, um, uh, for the particular residue that we're talking about, that you have this mixture, you know, where you have the mutant form, which is blue, and you have the wild-type form, which is red. And so that's just showing you what I already told you, uh, which is that in the blood, you have what looks to be a heterozygous state. What's more, if you look in the bone, so that's the blood. If you look in the bone marrow, you see that, in fact, you have the red and the blue right on top of one another. So again, you know, uh, it's a mixture of the two. And it still could be that either all the cells have both or some of the cells have one and other the cells have the other. So really, you have to somehow separate the cells into, and you don't know ahead of time how to separate them into some way where you would get the mutant in one type of cell and the wild type and another type of cell. But remember, we are the auto-inflammatory team. We are interested in innate immunity, which, remember, uh, involves myeloid cells. So, of course, you know, we're going to look at the neutrophils and monocytes and compare them with the T cells and B cells. And so when David did that, then what you can see is that the myeloid cells have the mutant form and that the lymphocytes have the wild type form. So that's exactly what you would want to see or what you would predict if these individuals, in fact, have a somatic mutation. And so then David did a digital droplet PCR uh, to confirm this, and you can see that in fibroblasts, uh, the mutant, the variant allele frac uh, fraction is zero. 
uh, in T cells and B cells at zero, in myeloid cells it's uh, quite high, and in fact, incredibly high, like 70%, 80%. I mean, this, this was lucky, uh, because in a lot of cases for somatic mutation, you see variant allele frac fractions that are like 5 or 10% for a lot of other diseases. So this was really, like, incredible. But not as incredible as what I'm going to tell you next. So the next part, fact stranger than fiction. So, uh, you know, we knew that these mutations are in the bone marrow. So we went to the hematopathologist, Kathy Calvo, uh, and we wanted to look at the bone marrow of these three patients. And so here we have it. Uh, and what you see is that these precursor cells in the bone marrow have these funny-looking vacuoles, which is not normal uh, in the precursor cells in the bone marrow. And she looked at it, and she looked at it, and she said, well, you know, I don't know what that is, but I've seen it before. I know I've seen this before somewhere, um, but she couldn't remember where. So then we came back a few days later, and she was so proud of herself. And she had these two reports in her hand, which she very ceremoniously presented to me. And she said, Dan, I remembered where I saw this before. These are reports from your patients from eight years ago. They had these vacuoles too. So you ought to go, and if they have the vacuoles, then they probably have the mutations in UBA1, somatic mutations in UBA1. You better go check that. Aye, aye, Capitan. So, so we went back and we checked those two patients, and lo and behold, they had it. So then we knew that there must be something there, you know, that, that this was actually, there was something that was really emerging. And then one of those patients, it turns out, had relapsing polychondritis. Um, and, and that then made us know that the skies, the, the clouds were parting and that the truth was upon us. Because, you see, there was this group with uh, Marcy Ferrada and Peter Grayson that had a whole cohort of like 100 patients at the NIH with relapsing polychondritis. So, so all of a sudden, we could go back and look at those patients and see if they had mutations in UBA1 also. Now, it didn't turn out that they all have mutations in UBA1, but about uh, 6 or 7% of them do have mutations in UBA1. And all of a sudden, we went from 3 patients to 25 patients in like no time at all. I mean, it was incredible. Um, and, and those patients carried a whole bunch of different diagnoses, which was really interesting, too. Um, this is a condition, just so that we put this in the right perspective, it's a bad disease to have. Something like 40% of the patients of this first 25 patients were already deceased. So, so this is something that you can die from, and you do die from. Um, 60% of them uh, had mutations, uh, had uh, relapsing polychondritis as the diagnosis that they carried. Sweet syndrome, you know, which is a condition where you develop boils all over your body. Older people sometimes get that in 32%. And then you can see myelodysplastic syndrome, MGUS, and a couple forms of uh, vasculitis, polyarteritis nodosa and giant cell arteritis. And some of the patients had more than one of these diagnoses. Um, that's why it adds up to more than 100%. But, in fact, they all have mutations, somatic mutations, in UBA1. So, it was time for an acronym. Uh, and so, uh, we decided, well, what are we going to call it? And, you know, this is like one of the, the big conversation things uh, in our lab, you know, well, what are, what are we going to call it? What's the acronym? You know, what would sound good? What's easy to remember? What's short enough, you know, that it's not going to be, uh, you know, too long and unpronounceable? Vexus, you know, was what uh, David came up with. So Vexus stands for vacuoles, you know why that is. E1 ubiquitin activating enzyme, uh, you know, so that's what UBA1 is, that's another biochemical name for it, X-linked, remember, it's X-linked, it's on the X chromosome, auto-inflammatory, 
somatic syndrome. And so some of the clinical features are shown here. This is a scan showing uh, uh, infiltrates in the lungs uh, in one of these patients. And here's uh, a neutrophilic, uh, neutrophilic infiltrate in the alveolus of one of the patients, medium vessel vasculitis in the skin, uh, chondritis of the ear and the vacuoles that we've already talked about. The cell type that uh, harbors this mutation the most probably is the neutrophil. And if you look by electron microscopy at a healthy neutrophil shown on the left versus a vexus neutrophil shown on the right, you can see that the vexus neutrophil looks really crummy. And that's been a, a puzzle to us, which we still don't have an answer to. You know, So, so you would say that somehow or other there's there's at least something that gives the neutrophils that have the mutation some kind of selective advantage because it predominates in the peripheral blood. So there's got to be something there. Um, but, you know, the cells look really crummy. If you take the cells out of patients, you know, to do any kind of in vitro study, they die right away. So, so these are definitely you know, at the end of the road, uh, neutrophils. And there's at least some evidence from Lenzon's group at Harvard that perhaps with these kinds of things that the selective advantage may be in the precursor cell and that that's, you know, it just pumps these cells out, uh, you know, that then don't have the selective advantage uh, at the latter stages of differentiation. Maybe that's what's going on. We don't know. Um, but in any case, if you look at gene expression profiling, you can see that um, uh, there's a prominent inflammatory signature in the myeloid cells, neutrophils and monocytes, and not in uh, the lymphocytes. If you look at it in terms of a molecular level of what's going on, so, so you know, the mutation is at position 41, methionine 41. So, so what is the uh, uh, transcriptional and translational landscape of the UBA1 gene? Well, it has two known methionines. One is at position 1 and the other is at position 41. Methionine 1, uh, if you start your translation there, you end up with a long isoform of the UBA1 protein, which is found in the nucleus. And then if you start at position 41, you have a shorter isoform that's found in the cytoplasm. So if you have a mutation at position 41, what's going to happen is that that shorter cytoplasmic form is not going to be around. And you might predict that you would then start at the next methionine, whatever that is, which happens to be pos position 67. So if you look then at uh, these blots of cells from patients uh, and controls. So, so in this blot here, you have three controls, three patients. UBA1 is the cytoplasmic high molecular weight form. UBA1B is the lower molecular weight, so nuclear form here, sorry. This is the nuclear form, cytoplasmic form, high molecular weight, lower molecular weight. Um, and what you can see in CD3 cells, which are lymphocytes, is that you have everything's fine. You know, the patients are just like the controls. You have the high molecular weight nuclear form and the lower molecular weight cytoplasmic form. But in CD14 positive myeloid cells, where the mutation is found, you still have in the patients the high molecular weight uh, nuclear form. But now you lose the UBA1B that would be starting at position 41, and instead you have this lower molecular weight form, which we call UBA1C. And um, that is associated with decreased ubiquitillation. That's because UBA1 is, is essential for all ubiquitillation, and also activated cellular stress. So in order to prove, in order to examine, in order to test the hypothesis that, in fact, what you get with UBA1C is starting at the next methionine down is that you can look at either cells transfected with wild-type UBA1, where again you get the high molecular weight nuclear A form and the lower molecular weight cytoplasmic B form. With the mutations uh, in the construct, 
methionine to valine at position 41, methionine to threonine, methionine to leucine. You see that you still have the high molecular weight nuclear form. You lose the UBA1B, normal cytoplasmic form, and you get the UBA1C, which we are saying we think starts at position 67. So if you think it starts at position 67, mutagenize position 67 and see if it goes away. So that's what we did, and lo and behold, it, it did go away. So that's probably what's going on, is, is that uh, the start site has been moved down to position 67, and in uh, experiments that I won't show you all of, uh, that's a dysfunctional form of the protein. The, at least some of the evidence for that is shown here on this plot. So UBA1B, the normal cytoplasmic form in this lane, UBA1C, the shorter cytoplasmic mutant form in this lane. And so what you get, UBA1 should get, in this assay, it should get charged. It should get, uh, basically, it forms a thioester bond uh, in this uh, reaction. And you can see that the lower molecular weight uncharged form for UBA1B, that's the normal version of it, there's very little uncharged, most of it is charged. All is good. That's what's supposed to happen. In the UBA1C, which is the mutant form, you see that most of it's uncharged, very little of it is charged. It's a dud. It's a dysfunctional UBA1. So, so that's, at a molecular level, what is going on here. So going back to the big picture, what's going on with Vexus? First of all, it's a paradigm shift in gene discovery, a genotype first rather than a phenotype first approach. Secondly, adults may develop autoinflammatory disease the same way that they develop cancers, by somatic mutations. So that was really a big realization to us, because all of a sudden, you start, you know, in our clinic, so one of the banes of my existence for the last decade, at least, has been all of these patients that we see in clinic, and these are, these are really hard cases. They are people who are suffering, and there are people that we don't have a lot for them. Uh, they're men and women uh, who present with undiagnosed fevers and inflammation in their 40s and 50s. And they don't have, as far as we can tell, and we get infectious disease to look at them, uh, they don't have any occult infection. They don't have cancer, which would be another explanation for unexplained recurrent fever. And we think they have some sort of an auto-inflammatory condition, but they don't have germline mutations in anything. So, so what is it? And you end up treating them with high doses of steroids, which gets them into all kinds of trouble. And, and that's it. That's what you have for them. But, you know, maybe what we have is the ability to look for somatic mutations that may give us an answer. In the case of Vexus, we don't have, right now, a targeted treatment for them. Uh, so, um, actually, probably the best advice that we have for those patients is to transplant them early. And a lot of times, that's a hard thing to do. That's a hard conversation to have with those people because they don't want to be transplanted when they're feeling relatively well. And by the time that they feel bad enough to want to be transplanted, they're also sick enough that their chances of surviving a transplant are a lot less. So, so it does give you information to talk to them about, you know, what is the right thing to do. And then the third thing, of course, is throw out the textbooks. Maybe you knew this before I gave this talk. Uh, but, you know, so why do I say throw out the textbooks? Well, it's just simply that maybe there's a, an organization scheme in terms of human diseases that's not based on the clinical picture. You know, that, for example, that all of the patients that we have with lupus, they don't actually have the same disease. They have somatic mutations and, you know, some things that we haven't looked for. And that, you know, forget about the, the names that we give them. You know, just look for the cause. Uh, so in any case, here's the people that uh, actually are responsible for a lot of the work that has been done in my lab. Um, and I know people have been looking at their watches. I better look at mine. It's 10.15. I have no idea when I'm supposed to be finished, but probably it was a while ago. Uh, but, but in any case, uh, I will just say that, uh, you know, 
uh, these people deserve to be uh, mentioned by name, Ivona Aksentievich, Ilone Pras, Mike Santola, Raman Sood, Mike McDermott, Jay Che, Rafaela Goldbachmansky, Elaine Remmers, Seth Masters, Amanda Umbrello, Steve Boyden, Ching Zhao, Yohei Carino, Masaki Takeuchi, Kelpin Amanthram, and David Beck, and I owe them all a lot. Uh, and uh, then this is just our lab and our clinical team before the pandemic when we didn't have to wear face masks or physically uh, distance. But the idea is just that this is a collaboration between clinic and lab. A number of uh, very valued uh, collaborators I won't name uh, by name. My family, uh, my wife, Margaret, to my right, your left, uh, and then uh, my sons, uh, Ben and Nathan, who've put up with these shenanigans over all of the years. Uh, and then uh, the last two slides, it's almost over. Uh, old questions for a new era. So I just want to uh, throw out these ideas, you know, in terms of since we're having this symposium on autoinflammatory diseases, at least we ought to think about, well, what ought we to be thinking about for the next 10 years or whatever. So. How do we connect genotype with phenotype for the monogenic autoinflammatory diseases? Well, we've been doing that for the last few years, but I will just tell you, which is obvious to anyone that's probably worked on any of these diseases, that it's actually a lot harder to figure out the mechanism of the disease nowadays than it is to find the gene. Not to trivialize the finding of the gene, but, you know, it's just that there's You've got, you know, the end point, you've got the beginning point, but all the dots in between, there's a lot of points there uh, in order to figure it out. And that's important information. To what extent are common autoinflammatory diseases collections of rare diseases? In some cases, they probably are. To what extent does somatic mutation cause late onset autoinflammatory disease? What's the role of autoinflammation in neurodegenerative disease? There's definitely a connection there. How does the body turn off inflammation? Most of the things that we've been working on are uh, turning on inflammation. What's the most efficient taxonomy of human disease? Is there a way of organizing them so that you'd understand the relationships between diseases and suggestive therapies better than the current organizational scheme? How can we develop inexpensive small molecule therapies for autoinflammatory disease, or any disease for that matter? And how can we develop gene therapies at scale? Obviously, you can develop gene therapies for lots of diseases, but, you know, if it costs, you know, millions and millions of dollars, probably you're not going to do it as often as you should. And then finally, uh, the last slide, which is just uh, to um, comment that, that I have at least given some of the, not all of, by any means, uh, but some of the uh, Crawford, uh, Crawford uh, uh, proceeds to uh, establish some awards in the autoinflammatory world that might encourage people to do more work in the world of autoinflammation. And of course, you know, uh, is there, does altruism exist? Well, you know, we can have that discussion for another hour, and, and you can say that none of this is altruistic. But to whatever extent it's whatever it is, um, uh, we're establishing in the ISSAID, the International Society of Systemic Autoinflammatory Diseases, a basic sciences award named after the late Jörg Chop, who of course was the uh, one of the original describers, maybe the original describer of the inflammasome who passed away 11 years ago. Isabel Tuitu, uh, one of our uh, great rivals in the FMF uh, positional cloning work, but certainly has been a major figure in the genetics of autoinflammatory diseases for many years, a human genetics award. Mordecai Pross, uh, my uh, friend and mentor and collaborator uh, in Israel. Uh, uh, a clinical investigation award, uh, Alberto Martini, the founder of Printo, the uh, pediatric clinical research uh, consortium for clinical trials, and then Charles Dinarello, uh, a trainee award. Uh, he surpassed uh, Crawford uh, Laureate. So anyway, this is an award that, a set of awards that will recognize some of these people who are my heroes and hopefully encourage other people to become the heroes of the future. So in any case, with that, uh, I will call it to a close and uh, try to answer your questions if you're not either thirsty or hungry or have to go to the bathroom. Uh, so anyway, thank you.